It's a question that museums around the world struggle with. Who owns art, antiquities, cultural artifacts, and even human remains taken by colonial powers over the past few centuries? From the so-called Elgin marbles removed from Greece to the cultural artifacts of Canada's First Nations displayed around the globe, there are growing demands for such items to be returned. What's a museum to do? Joining us now to explore that in Victoria, British Columbia via Skype, Lucy Bell, head of First Nations and Repatriation at the Royal BC Museum. And here in our studio, Kara Krimpotich, Associate Professor and Director of Museum Studies at the University of Toronto and the author of The Force of Family, Repatriation, Kinship and Memory on Haida Gwaii. And Gail Lord, President, Lord Cultural Resources and co-author of Cities, Museums and Soft Power. Karen Gale, nice to have you here again. You here for the first time. And Lucy, nice to have you on the program from the left coast. Gail, I want to, let's just, I, I, one of the reasons we're doing this, obviously, is that the Elgin Marbles have been such a big case for such a long time. We, uh, we covered it on the program, I remember, many years ago. It's gained worldwide attention. How common are these campaigns to repatriate antiquities? Okay, great question. First of all, they're no longer called the Elgin Marbles. They're now officially called the Parthenon Marbles. So I think that that's actually been a big success of the campaign, is to say it's really not about Lord Elgin. It's, it's, a, it's about the Parthenon, and it's about Greeks and, and their heritage and their history. Now, hang on. Do, do the Brits call them th that as well? I think that they are calling them the Parthenon okay. Marbles because they also want to take the limelight away from the historic incident. So the historic incident is very contested. Was he saving them? Was he pillaging? Hmm. And frankly, it's a 50-50 thing. 51, 50, 49, 50, depending mm -hmm. on how you look at it. It was certainly something that could only happen because it was a colonial era in which everybody was plundering from, from defeated countries. So, so how, much uh, the, how much of this is going on in the world today where, where the original country is trying to repatriate something it once okay. lost? So I'd say that a lot is going on. The two most high profile are probably the Ben and Bronzes and the Parthenon marbles. They're the, the really high profile ones. But it's going on all the time. And of course, the the uh, restitution of, of, of works that were stolen and plundered from Jewish people during the Nazi era has even shed more light on this issue. So people accept that because it's, it's quite recent, uh, it was clearly theft, uh, clearly in a terrible moment of history, but the acceptance by museums of the more distant past is not really not very strong. Gotcha. Let me add this to the record here from the New York Times from a few years ago. In 2007, <clears throat> at an opening of an exhibition of repatriated antiquities, the Italian vice prime minister and cultural minister said, quote, the odyssey of these objects, which started with their brutal removal from the bowels of the earth, didn't end on the shelf of some American museum. Instead, he said, these beautiful pieces have reconquered their souls. More recently, the Turkish culture and tourism minister declared that, quote, each and every antiquity in any part of the world should eventually go back to its homeland. These politicians and others like them maintain that cultural property objects are just like people. If they are not repatriated, they will remain refugees or prisoners of war. Let me get you to weigh in on that, Kara. What's your take? I think it's true. Um, Russell Thornton has spoken powerfully in the United States Who's that he? Uh, he was uh, with the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, he offered that as long as the artifacts or human remains are still with the colonial power or still outside the home territory, that the offense is not past, it continues. And the harm is not a past harm, but it's an ongoing violence. And so he really um, saw repatriation as a chance to heal. Um, and to put an end to historic violence that was ongoing into the present. Lucy, what's your view on the need to quote unquote repatriate every item or object or antiquity that was taken from somewhere else once upon a time? Well, I, I'm a strong believer in repatriation. I, I helped to repatriate over 500 of my ancestors. And now we are on, on a journey to repatriate our cultural belongings. And I grew up in a, in a time where we learned how to hide a dance, um, beating, beating um, an ice cream bucket because we didn't have drums in our community, wearing masks made out of paper because we didn't have masks in the community. And meanwhile, there's, there's you know, over 10,000 Haida belongings scattered around, around the world. So I'm a strong believer in, in, in people having their own 
belongings. Let me unpack that answer a bit. You said at the beginning, 500 of your ancestors. What was that a reference to? When I was an intern here at the Royal BC Museum, I learned about uh, human remains being in museums. And the, the RBCM at the time had seven of my ancestors from my community. And I began my journey of tracking down all of my ancestors' human remains that have ended up in museums, that have sat in museums on shelves, paper, plastic bags um, for over 100 years. And it, was, uh, it took my community over 20 years to, to bring them home. How did those remains end up in museums in the first place? I think a number of ways. So uh, often it was looting. So as you know, with uh, smallpox, uh, indigenous cultures were um, dying. Um, so you know, my my um, Haida Gwaii community dropped down to less than a thousand people. So imagine, you know, the 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 death that was on my little island, and people thinking that they were saving a bit of something. So collectors, visitors, sailors. Um, up to modern day archaeology, thinking they're saving a little bit of something that was dying. Kara, at what point did the tide turn so that this clearly became a thing not to do and repatriation was necessary? Well, here in Canada, one of the, bur the first big repatriations that we saw was the return of a confiscated potlatch collection. And um, the material was confiscated in the 1920s. It ended up in the uh, federal museums, the Royal Ontario Museums. Um, and in the 1960s, the Kwakwakiawak Nation started asking for it back. Hmm. Uh, and it wasn't until later in the 1970s that uh, the first set of masks and potlatch regalia went home uh, to the Kwakwakiawak Nation. And that was really one of the first big moments in Canada where we saw this as a possibility. So for decades, though, you would have heard nothing about this. What, what, what sort of put it more on the front burner now? In that case, it was uh, the change in a law in the Indian Act. Um, but I think Indigenous communities were always asking for things back. They just didn't often get a positive response. Hmm. Um, definitely with the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act that came into effect in the United States in 1990, that really pushed the museum community uh, by large in North America in particular to address this head on. Actually, I, I'd say that this is a great example of Canada being in advance of the rest of the world yeah. because, and therefore our, our Indigenous people being in advance of the rest of the world and I think that there's always so much to learn from Indigenous people so what's interesting is it only becomes a, a fact if you like outside Canada um, in 1970 which is a very interesting date so that's the date when UNESCO which is a very important part of the United Nations passes its uh, covenant uh, for restitution of, of stolen and looted goods now what's interesting about 1970 1970 is actually the end of colonialism on our earth i think that there's a couple of key dates about us as human beings when we changed fundamentally as human beings through law right not, not maybe in our nature so one is 1970 there really are no more colonies there's neo colonies but there's no more really legal colonies internationally at that time. So it becomes possible to actually think about this as a universal new mm. standard of behavior. Um, the other date, which I'll be happy to talk about, is 2008, which is the first time when human beings become urban dwellers, more than 50% for the first time in human history. So in our lifetimes, at least I think some of our lifetimes, we, we have these two big watershed changes in, in human relations. Now what's interesting, I think, and significant and really tough is, okay, you have a recognition in 1970, colonialism's over, right? So, so now we have to have a new approach. Meanwhile, Indigenous people in Canada have already started demanding uh, restitution and end to their humiliation. Let's, let's put restitution and humiliation are, are very closely related. And yet, how long does it take to change human nature? That's really, mm. how long does it take to change the, the behavior of museums to being from being acquisitors, handmaidens, if you like, of colonialism, to being something else. Well, let me put that question to Lucy. I, I, I guess when the repatriation requests go into museums and it's now official, how do museums tend to uh, respond to those kinds of requests? In my experience, we had much better luck with uh, Canadian museums. So starting locally, museums in, in British Columbia 
who we already had relationships with, they were much more open to repatriation and building a relationship. Uh, the further away we got from home, the more difficult it became. Um, getting into Europe, um, asking to have a meeting six months down the road, you know, we were often wet, met with, um, no, sorry, sorry, but we're we're busy in six months. Um, Do you want to name so and shame there, Lucy? Pardon? Do you want to name and shame? I don't mind if you do. Who, who's, who's the museum that told you, sorry, we're busy six months from now, we're washing our hair that morning? <laughs> uh, it was the Pitt Rivers Museum. Um, and it, at Oxford. And we, you know, I felt, we felt very fortunate when Kara um, came on board and came in and lived with me to study um, Haida repatriation uh, while she was studying at Oxford. Hmm. You want to pick up that story, Kara? <laughs> sure. Um, as a doctoral student, I was really interested in repatriation and I thought that it was going to align with um, treaty rights in Canada. Um, and as I started to learn more about repatriation histories in Canada, particularly from Indigenous perspectives, mm. uh, the Haida Repatriation Committee came up time and time again as people who were doing incredibly progressive work. They were doing it from an ethical um, position. And so I asked if I could come and learn about what they were doing and the process they undertook. And so um, Lucy agreed that I could come and live with her and her family. Um, and people in Skidigit as well uh, also hosted me and, and uh, enabled me to um, live with them for the year and understand what repatriation meant. Well, uh, tell me this. When, when you make an official request to a museum and they yeah. say to you, not only are we not interested in returning this object that you want, but we're not even prepared to take a meeting with you to talk about this. Right. What do you do then? A few things happened, I think, with the Pitt Rivers. One was a change in staff. Um, so a colleague of ours, Laura Pierce, joined the museum. She came from Canada. She was open. Uh, Laura and I were both trained in the spirit of the task force report, which was written by the Canadian Museum Association and the Assembly of First Nations. Mm -hmm. That came out in 1992. It was much more about an ethical relationship between museums and Indigenous communities. And so Laura was over in the UK. She had a number of students who came to study repatriation. The Pitt Rivers started to open up a little bit. And so we had some fun and we invited 11 Haidas to come to the museum. And of course, the Haida Repatriation Committee, being the strong advocates they are, brought 21 people um, and, and filled the museum with joy and laughter and song and language and culture. Did it move the yardsticks at all? It did. It did. Um, and after that visit, um, the request went back in for um, Lou's ancestor, and we were able to get that ancestor home within a year, I think it was, um, and bring that ancestor we were home. back there in three months, Kara. Yeah. We yeah, it was. It, it happened so quickly, and in the spirit of friendship, which is how, um, you know, we're we're Canadians. So you know, we'll we'll always act in the spirit of friendship and collaboration and forgiveness and and kindness. Let's just that do work. A, let's just do a definition here, Gail. Universal museums. What are oh they? God. So this is something where I, I don't feel the milk of human kindness. So maybe maybe Lucy will help me out here on this one. It's basically nineteen museums who have. Uh, multicultural and multinational collections. Uh, they include the British Museum, the Louvre, the Hermitage, the Met in uh, New York. How about our own Royal Ontario Actually, Museum? Actually, apparently not. Not as no? far as okay. we know. We did check. Uh, that's interesting. So hopefully somebody from the ROM can, can tell us. Hopefully they've, they've rejected the idea. I'd be very happy if they did. Lucy, do you know what the ROM status is as a universal museum? I'm not sure. No. They, they are yeah. a universal museum by type but they haven't signed the Declaration of Universal right. Museums. And the implication of signing that declaration is what? Go ahead, You Lucy. aren't going to return anything, basically. You, yeah, you, you know, if asked, you will polite. return. Pardon? You will not. You, you will, will not. not. If asked, you will not return. That's more like... So they, right. they're, they're not that bold-faced about it. They say that uh, we've looked after these objects for hundreds of years. We spent a lot of money doing it. We are great sites. So the whole world comes to our door if you're in New York or you're in Paris or you're in London or, or frankly, if you're in St. Petersburg as well. And so everybody can come here and see it. We protect them. We're not warlike people. We're not about to be in war, uh, which is kind of crazy because if you think about the destruction during the 18th century, during the wars of religion, <clears throat> how much was actually destroyed in these countries, uh, it, it just kind of begs the question. Uh, you can't be sure well, of this forever. But I think that, that there, there's, there's something else to think about. 
all the 19 are in the north of the hemisphere. Mm -hmm. Not a single one is in the south. So I think that this is an issue of how are we going to live together on Earth? This isn't just a question of who owns, what is the provenance, and I, I think your story, your happy story, uh, is maybe at the root of what we have to do because the legalistic approach is well, not going to go okay. anywhere. Okay, humor me here for a second. Sure. Because there's not a debate if you don't have two sides. Here's what the other side has to say about this. Can we put this graphic up? Critics of repatriation argue that returning human <clears throat> remains or cultural artifacts to the cultures of origin yeah. could set a precedent that would eventually decimate museum and university collections and result in a loss of information regarding the history of humanity. Museums, such as those that have signed the Declaration on the Importance and Value of Universal Museums, assert that an object does more for the public good in their collections because diverse objects are able to teach society about other cultures and build appreciation and acceptance through examining multicultural artifacts displayed next to one another. Okay, that's the argument. Lucy, you persuaded at all by that? <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> You're not persuaded that, because that, why? Well, that that knowledge is is needed by the people whose belongings uh, they belong to. So, you know, the the songs, the stories, um, the family connections that go with my my Haida belongings mm -hmm. that are in Washington or or Europe. Um, who better knows about those than than me and 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 my people. And I think of this one piece that stood out to me that's in the Pitt Rivers Museum, and it's these um, carved salmon. And they're, they're used for uh, when the salmon stocks were low. Um, and you know, and we're, the, the world is in such a crisis right now. Our oceans are in crisis. And to be able to, to reach, reach to that spirituality, to my traditional beliefs, to, to help our oceans, and those belongings are, are sitting uh, in Oxford. That's doing. That's not doing anybody any good. Is there, Gail, any um, validity to the argument that it makes some sense to visit one museum and see the entire span of human history in one place? And let me add this caveat: a lot of people don't have a lot of, you know, enough money necessarily to travel all over the world to right. see all these kinds of things. Okay. So, is there any logic to having them all under one roof? Okay, <clears throat> there's logic if what that statement that you said was true. So if you've been, and I think a lot of your viewers have been to the Louvre, and many of them will have been to the British Museum or to the Met or any of these other museums, what they will see is they will not see objects from different cultures side by side. They will see a particular interpretation of civilization which suits a, a really an imperial mindset of the 19th century. It's not even a 20th century imperial mindset, which has really moved on. So, so now we hear that the British Museum is gonna reinstall its collections. That will take about 15 or 20 years. And um, the Louvre has done, a, by the way, a brilliant job of doing exactly that, that kind of installation in Abu Dhabi but they're nowhere anywhere near the intention of doing that in Paris. So it's true, you can see everything under one roof, but you don't see a comparison of cultures mm -hmm. and you don't see a multicultural interpretation at all. Um, there is a lot of truth to the idea that scholars, it's convenient for scholars to do one-stop shopping. That, that's a true mm -hmm. statement. And it's also true to say that there's lots of research that needs to be done. But these are essentially human processes. And if we want human processes, we have to have a human way of addressing them, getting the stories. And so I actually have a question for, for well, our hang on. Before you guest. go there, I want oh. to get Kara's take okay, on it. Okay, right. I would Sorry. really love to see if we could move to a museum, whether it be universal or local, where all of the items in it were collected through free and informed consent. So with research, mm, we brought up the question idea. of research. Great, yeah. um, in research now, the, the ethical protocol is that people have to <clears throat> offer free and informed consent. If there are other parameters, those are very exceptional circumstances. What would it be um, for the Haida Nation to decide which of their pieces would be ambassadors for their, for their nation hmm. around the world and that they could offer those? Uh, if they so chose, um, and to put those into conversation. There are a lot of south-south conversations, south-north conversations happening. But what we need is for people to actively opt in, not just say, well, we've had it all this time, and therefore we're just going to continue to do it. Does such a museum exist today? 
Not that I know of in its entirety, though I have seen um, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science yeah. moving towards this, mm -hmm. particularly with human remains in their collections. And Kara, what about, I mean, if you were sitting here with a, an official from the British Museum who then said to you, great, let's do that and we'll be completely cleaned out of absolutely everything and we'll cease to exist, how would that help humanity? Well, it's never happened that a truck has backed up and emptied out a museum. We hear this time and time again. It'll open the floodgates. It'll empty museums. In the, in the history so far of repatriation, this has never happened. We have no precedent for it. But if you took your argument to the logical extension, mm -hmm. how much of the British Museum would have to be emptied out if you were going to repatriate everything that's in there that's not from the UK? It's not that everything would necessarily leave. It would, would be that communities of origin would have the option to say yes or no. Ah. How about we send this instead? We'd really like to highlight contemporary artists. Here, let's send contemporary art for a while. Maybe, you know, women are underrepresented in collections. Maybe we would have a better insight into women's lives through time and history. And is it possible, Gail, that some of the originating communities could say, actually, you're doing a good job hosting our pieces this way. Yeah. We'll, we'll leave them there under the proviso that we own them. Right. I, I think there there is a possibility. And actually, I want to ask Lucy this. You know, when I went to the uh, Quai Branly Museum, which is actually a client of ours, and I went through the collection that was on display, and I saw magnificent Haida material. Where is this scale? It's in Paris. It's okay. their, it's the equivalent of their national, it's a fairly new National Ethnography Museum. And I just have to admit, we all have our guilty secrets, right? So there I am, and I'm thinking, wow, Canadian indigenous objects are beautiful enough, because the French are always in the beauty business, you know, beautiful <laughs> enough to be included here. And then uh, for people who saw the wonderful, fantastic Picasso in Africa exhibition recently at <laughs> the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, realize that those objects really had a profound effect on the entire of modern art, and, and if Picasso hadn't seen them in what was in the Museum of Man, now the mm -hmm. Cape Bronley Museum, probably art would not be anything like what we what we know it is so today. You've so, introduced a little wrinkle so here to it. So what I'd like to know, Lucy, is would you don't do you under what circumstances do you think it's important that these objects do be in museums all over the world, not just in the north, but also in the south? And how would you go about it? <laughs> Big question. Mm. I, I often think of the art of Bill Reed. Uh, his his beautiful masterpieces are all Incredible. over the world, and they tell a, you know beautiful stories of the Haida and represent Haida, um, Northwest Coast, um, Canada, so well. Uh, and it was a choice. He made that that choice to make those pieces and and have them all over the world. I think that's that's the difference that I see that. You know, for, for people to be making that choice not to have their belongings looted or sold for 25 cents, um, there there's a difference. Mm -hmm. Kara, help us out with a, a more recent example. Uh, it's, I guess, 15 years since the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Mm -hmm. There was, as we know, complete lawlessness, and there was considerable looting, and there were numerous antiquities that were in Iraq that are no longer there or were no longer there and, you know, moved out to places all over the world. Uh, efforts have been undertaken to repatriate some of those objects. Mm -hmm. Fill us in. What's happened? Well, as I understand, um, with the Iraq situation, there were two levels of looting. And one was highly organized, targeted looting. And one was uh, very sort of spontaneous uh, people from the area who were looking things to help them survive in a war. So some of the things that were taken for the museum were furniture um, and um, you know, uh, things that people could sell readily or use in their homes, uh, and other things were artifacts. Um, the last number I have now, this is a little bit out of date, is that 15,000 mm. items were looted and 6,000 had been returned quite quickly in the first intervening months, the first mm. few intervening months. Since then, um, various international bodies try to help in these situations. So Interpol has a database of missing art. Um, ICOM will release red lists when there's global crisis, whether it is from civil conflict or civil war, or if it's from natural disasters. And they will publicize yeah. the kinds of items that are likely to enter the market and try to raise awareness amongst people um, to not purchase them if they encounter them at auction or if they encounter them on a market, to notify authorities and hopefully to stop them entering the black market. And there are people who specialize in understanding 
the black market and how essentially the process of mon money laundering happens to antiquities. Hmm. And so certain ports are likely to forge export permits um, or might forge a date. Oh, right. And so um, it, it is being treated like organized crime. Uh, we see this again with the conflict in Syria. Um, and a lot of material is leaving Syria. My colleague um, at the ROM, Clemens Reichel, believes that you know, Syrian looting is just going to dwarf the Iraqi case. Hmm. Um, so right. we're all trying to keep an eye on it. Tell us about black market. How, mu how much activity is there there? Oh, I can't tell you. I imagine that there's a lot at any given point in time. I mean, the world of art hmm. is, a, is a, including contemporary work by living artists, is, is all about uh, things that you could never do on the stock market. But how do you, uh, you know, how do you buy something on a black market? You, and well, then show it in your own, uh, you can't well, show it anywhere, can you? Well, it's presented to you by a legitimate dealer, usually. So who hmm. has a provenance, which is not, or provenance is just one of our fancy words for the case history of the, yeah. of the object that, that has been faked, I think. What do you think? Hmm. Cara, one of know. the things people um, often don't realize is the poor state of museum records. So um, a lot of the items in museums were collected really before photography. So there isn't an image. Um, you might have very cursory descriptions of pieces. And if you have 5,000 cylinders, for example, as the Iraq Museum did, uh, very rarely are they all described in a way that you could separate one from the other. Mm. <laughs> and so we have a documentation crisis. This is true in terms of indigenous uh, human remains and indigenous artifacts as well. Often museum records are not sound or not complete enough to give us the provenance we're hoping. Wow. Um, but also people will, people will purchase on the black market because they love the piece and they know it's illegal and they know it's wrong, but they buy it anyway. It. They buy it anyway. <clears throat> and then display it in their homes? Sure, or in a private collection or. And they don't worry about getting busted? Guess not. No. Not. Bring the, let's bring up the picture of the chest, shall we? Lucy, you can see that, yes? I can see that. Do you want to describe what we're looking at, please? This is uh, the moon chest uh, the, from the uh, uh, people of Skidans village. And it's been in New York for um, a very long time. And it recently went home um, to Haida Gwaii for uh, Gu Zhao, uh, Chief Gidansta's potlatch. And it was used in ceremony. Um, the Haida Gwaii Museum uh, were the hosts of the chest and brought it home on loan from New York and it was escorted home and um, used in, in, a, in a ceremony where it was filled with copper shields that um, the chief's family gave out um, to, to community members. Um, and now it's uh, on loan and sits in the Haida Gwaii Museum. Let me read something that Marsha Lederman wrote in the Globe and Mail about this last year. After more than a century away from home, the mountain goat moon chest was allowed to live again. Liberated from museum storage in a foreign land, the iconic chest was wheeled out to the middle of a packed rec center gym in Skidigat, British Columbia, on remote Haida Gwaii, as hundreds watched. The crowds were there for a historic potlatch when the surprised guest star stole the show. No protective glass, no roped off borders, just a dolly separating the chest from the old growth wood floor where the Haida play basketball. A treasure itself, the box was packed with more. 25 copper shields, important symbols of wealth in Haida culture, which were handed out that Easter weekend in a powerful ceremony. Lucy, I've got to ask, were you there at that ceremony? I wasn't. Um, but, you know, I saw, definitely followed it on social media, and uh, we've been working with Gujao here um, at the museum in Victoria, so you know I've I've heard such amazing things, um, and how how great that our relationship. So we've had a long the Haida have had a long relationship with the uh, AMNH, and that's the American get, Museum of Natural History. Yes, mm -hmm. so we've repatriated ancestral remains, done exhibits with them, had you know a lot of visiting artists go to the museum, and have some some long lasting friendships there. So to be at a point now in history where belongings are coming back into the community, um, I think we're making progress. So what I think is really amazing about this story and that the story you told that it happened in Oxford is that we can see that the taking away of people's culture is part of humiliation 
it's part of making people feel inferior, mm. disempowering them, and ultimately destroying them. And that's, of course, what the North has been all about for quite a few hundreds of years in their relationship between, broadly speaking, the Southern Hemisphere. Mm. So I guess that the, the, the thing that's so, I, I hate to use a corny word like heartwarming, but it's really very heartwarming, is to see that the impact of these returns, how it builds confidence, how it builds culture, and is it possible to hope for the day? So meanwhile, of course, our big museums get more and more mean-spirited. Like, think about it. Pe be people formerly feeling pretty terrible about themselves are starting to regain, for lots of reasons, economic as well, regaining self-confidence, right, in themselves. Our museums in the North are getting more and more mean. They're getting more and more <clears throat> legalistic about what they own, what they don't own, what is title, what isn't title. So hmm. is there a hope that this a kind of a spirit of kindness can be the future, and maybe in another 100 years. I mean, after all, it's only since 1970 that we've officially mm -hmm. stopped colonialism. Right. Well, I think Lou's story about the American Museum of Natural History and the relationship with the Haida is not uncommon. Uh, often what we see is the return of artifacts from a museum to a community leads to an improved and continued ongoing re relationship. So um, after the visit of, uh, of Haida's to the Pitt Rivers Museum, other projects followed. Um, and there are other cases as well. I don't know if large museums are meaner. Um, one of the things we see happening right now in European museums, uh, particularly, say, in Berlin, for example, is um, um, refugees becoming docents yeah. and tour guides mm -hmm. and telling mm -hmm. their histories with those collections. Um, and this is one effort on the part of museums to think about uh, social harmony, to think about justice, to think about what it is to be refugee. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, we are then in this difficult position because sometimes those collections maybe were not collected ethically in the first place. Um, you know, there is the question of should they go home, and maybe that's a longer question. Um, and in the short term, you know, what, el what other work can those collections do? And I, I think the pairing of refugees and museum collections is powerful for Absolutely. both refugees, uh, the collections themselves, but also society. Lucy, do you have any sense about how many items are still out there that you would like to see repatriated? Um, I think our estimates are over 10,000 um, Haida objects are out there. And mm -hmm. as far as we know, there's one Haida ancestor still in the British Museum. So this is literally generations and generations and generations of work ahead, not just for you, but for, <laughs> for many generations to come, I guess. Oh yeah, definitely. And I think, I think not all of those belongings, I think it might be unrealistic to think that all 10,000 of those would ever go home, that we'd ever have the space um, for them. Uh, you know, the, the Haida Gwaii Museum is bursting at the seams. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a repatriation is such a big and complicated um, issue. And there are still presumably lots of human remains that still need repatriating as well. Is that fair to say? All over in museums all over the globe, and I, you know, I know that my repatriation work with my ancestors is, is partly why uh, the Royal BC Museum asked me to come here to help repatriate the ancestral remains from our collection. Hmm. Okay, we got about five minutes left here, and let's get into some of the political response around some of this. And Carol, let me bring you in on this, Bill C three ninety one. Okay, what is that? This is a private member's bill. Uh, I believe it's in its second reading at the moment. And it is an effort to create a national strategy, uh, a federal law, uh, that supports the return of Aboriginal cultural patrimony to communities. For, and regardless of where they are in the world? Correct. That, that okay. It's not laid out explicitly, but that is the implied wording. How, Gail, can you force another country through a law of the Canadian Parliament right. to do this. Okay. Well, the way the bill is written, you can't even force Canadian institutions either. It's really very much hmm. a, in the, I think it's very much in a positive spirit, such as we've been talking about. It's not particularly legalistic. It doesn't force anybody to do anything. It says that this would be a desirable future, that it's really an outgrowth of the truth and reconciliation process, which clearly it is. 
and that um, the, the, there's a two-year period after the bill is passed in which there has to be a major report, which will then talk about processes and procedures, um, which may or may not be legally binding. In any case, outside our own country, it, it would depend on diplomacy. Is it anything more than kind of a hopeful statement of intent? Hopeful statements of intent are good things, as opposed to hopeful <laughs> statements of bad intent, yeah. yes, which we have a lot of in the world today, as a matter yeah. of fact. <laughs> so, no. Canadian museums have been working since 1992, um, Indigenous communities as well, based on hopeful statements of intent and, and a set of ethical principles. We haven't gone a legalistic route to date, so it is interesting that mm. it's, it's in front of Parliament. Lucy, do you imagine that if and when this law is passed and gets royal assent, that it will be helpful to you in your future requests? I think it will be helpful if it's if it's more in the spirit of the task force mm -hmm. report, um, encouraging um, museums to work in the spirit of fr friendship and collaboration and reconciliation, as opposed to NAGPRA, which was get it done, get it done now. Um, I think that was you know museums were tired when we when we hit the museums in in um, United States. You know the people were tired and resentful and just not quite willing to to work with us. So uh, I, th I I'm hopeful for it. I'm I'm always hopeful for hmm. for positive change in Canada. You used an acronym there that I wasn't familiar with. What was it? NAGPRA or something like that? What is, yes. What does that stand for? Uh, what is it? Native American Graves Repatriation Act. Did I get that right, Kara? The Native yeah. American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Graves Protection. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Got it. All right. It, well, th this law is not in place yet. We are, as you suggested, relying on the kind of kindness of strangers to make all this work out. Absolutely. So, Gail, just, you know, in our remaining time here, what, what do you believe is the ideal way to go about repatriation requests? Okay, so I believe the ideal path forward is, is really what, what Kara described, which is that we should all, and not everything is, is an Indigenous or Abo Aboriginal issue. Some are from countries where borders have changed and people have changed and who is a Greek then, who is a Greek now. There's all kinds of issues. But countries need to sit down, museums need to sit with people, and I think ultimately people are going to want their great objects to be shown around the world. I think that Indigenous people in Latin America would love to see the great achievements of the Haida, but it's up to the Haida to decide what they don't need mm -hmm. filling their storage rather than mm -hmm. having it in the storage of some northern museum. And likewise, I think it's probably true about Greek antiquities. I'm sure the Greeks would want people from the huge countries, well, I'm just picking Latin America, or the mm -hmm. huge cities in, in Africa, to see and be inspired by their work and then come to Greece. So I, I think it's about empowering people, really. They want to be the deciders. Well, don't you want to be the decider, too, in I your life? I am never the decider. <laughs> <laughs> you may think I am, but I am never the decider. I but think I, all human I understand. beings would love to be able to have more agency, yes. I, I understand the instinct. Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, thanks, everybody, for this conversation. Can we thank Lucy Bell, who was on there from Victoria, British thank Columbia, you. via Skype, Royal BC Museum. Uh, is both uh, where she works and uh, the Twitter handle as well, if you want to find out more about them. Uh, Gail Lord, Lord Cultural Resources here in the Big Smoke, and Kara Krimpotich, University of Toronto. Uh, so good to have all of you on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. It was super. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.